Can you do it? Huh? Can you do it? Yeah. Oh, that, that was so good. It's the record button. Oh, Jason's speaking. No, he's the host now. That's why. He's what? He's the host. Oh. Jason's the host? Yeah. Typical Jason. So the other thing is, this thing's like, finicky as fuck. That's like a terrible combination. I know. Like, it would be good, I need to get a battery, basically. So you touched it, which... Hey. Huh? Who? Really? Yeah. What class is this? Uh, I'm the guy Oh, you're Jeffrey okay, Song. Yeah, I thought you were in a different country. No, uh, before last week, I'm Kyle Song. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I'm just making sure, like when someone says, I'm I'm here for this class, I'm like, yeah, but class? which class is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Some law class, huh? Ah, yeah. yeah, oh, you need uh tree sloth? Yeah. Yeah, Hello, I'm back. Oops. Just double checking, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Ravindu, are you going to help Jeffrey out? Sure. Cool, thanks. Is this a notice board of every single record? You mean the, the thing oh, that's oh. like, yeah. you are using Cox, warning, do not delete anything. Yeah, three times before pressing the delete key. Yeah, all of that. Yeah, that's on all our Revit models. <laughs> like, I, I have an issue with doing those types of things because people don't read them. Like if you're if you just constantly barrage people with the same message over and over again, I, I never look at that front page. Oh, so do you have like a page where you put your previous recipes like after and kind of um make another do you want to use Slack? Sure. Yeah, so last week's lecture I haven't I haven't been able to process it because I've lost access to Premiere. But I will get it. Wait, why do you have to go into Premiere? Because I, I have to record multiple tr uh, tracks of audio. Because I because Hank's talking, so I have to record audio onto one track, and then I'm talking, so I have to record that onto a track, and I I don't know how it sounds when I'm recording, so Hank might be like, <laughs> so I've got to use Premiere to basically level that out, or otherwise Hank might be like, <laughs> and now I'm like, <laughs> like you know, because you're recording your mic. Yeah, so I can kind of, like, you can see... So, like, my, if I'm recording it, that's, like, already a lot better, easier, I guess. Yes. So basically, evening out. I'm just relying on you as a backup. Yeah. Someone's recording with the drink. Right? Yeah, so that basically, if someone's recording, then if Russell touches my power pack again and the computer dies, then at least we've still got that recording, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm going to reopen up Sandbox. Um, what I've done is I have, 
Uh, should I send this to you? Yeah, I'll send it to you as well. I'll upload the other file. Um, I've written a CSS code component, right? Now, I've password protected it. So you guys can't copy the code. But I'm about, we're going to talk through the code. The reason I don't want you to copy the code is you, I need you to write it. Like, the, the problem here is it's so easy for us to, to just um, copy and paste someone else's work. Um, so, I've put a password on it. If you can break the password, let me know. Because I want to know how to break the password. I haven't worked out how to break those passwords. So, are you going to break my password? Maybe. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, don't touch my power board. That's the power board. Uh, CSS component. Okay, so that's that's also there as well, and I'll just demonstrate. I'll demonstrate what it will do, and you guys can play around with it as well if you want. And then at the end of at the end of this assignment, I will remove the password protection so that you guys can have it and edit it. Cool, because that's that's. I, I don't care about secrets. I just care about, at the moment, you guys learning it. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. CSS dev, open recovery file. Okay, we're back. So this this particular part of the script is a, is getting the to and from room of the doors. So like a door that's going from... Uh, the corridor to one of the units um, will know, like it will return that. So you can see here, um, this particular room uh, that we are looking at is connected to another, it's a, a room called room. And then, oh, hang on. Boo, 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 boo. So like if we break that all down, uh, the room that I'm that we're looking at right now, this this first room, is connected to a room called room, and a room called corridor. So if I if you look at this floor plan, if there was a room that was connected to another room called room and an, and another room called corridor, which room could we be considering? Like like which one satisfies that condition? A room connected by a door to another room called room and another room called corridor. Huh? Units? Yeah, any of the units satisfies that condition, right? If I was just looking at room, this particular one, what room would it be connected to? Mm. Right. So it might be important later for our CSS to know, okay, like for example... Uh, I mentioned before, if we put toilets in, toilets toilets will aut might automatically make our room a toilet. But let's say we don't put toilets in. Another way that we could identify a toilet is just to say that it is the room is only ever connected to a unit. Every toilet in the hotel is going to be just connected to a unit. Have you you guys have been in a hotel? Huh? What about the lobby? No, no, we're talk we're just talking about this particular zone. Okay, but do you know do you know what I'm getting at? So there's there's actually two ways that we could tackle it. We could tackle it as someone going and having to model toilets in, or we could tackle it with uh, by the the door connections. And yeah, if somebody like right, so let's say we start the corridor, they would just like they would make the corridor in Revit first, and then start just going oh the next 
next room is a uh, hotel room. So well, let's if we build the code up, then you guys can. This is why it's a sandbox. You guys can go and model part of it and see what happens. Now, Grasshopper needs to be running at the same time, but we'll see what happens. So what I did was I, I've grabbed not only the rooms, um, the rooms name. I'm also grabbing its class and its tier, and most of these are coming out as null. But um, you can see here th this particular uh, tier has one and two, and that those are those two rooms that I was editing before with the um, with the department and so on and so forth. Um, and then I'm also grabbing uh, all plumbing fixtures, and I'm doing this in a really silly way. Um, I'm, I'm doing it in a way that was like made. 30 minutes ago for this class, right? So it's re it's a really simple way. I basically grabbed all plumbing fixtures. I've said any plumbing fixture, if if a room has any plumbing fixture in it, then that room gets a parameter called has toilet. And that parameter is either true or false, okay? If this was any other project, that would fail miserably because drains and taps and all these other things are also plumbing fixtures and so that wouldn't satisfy the has toilet instead i would have some parameter like list of furniture or list of fixtures and, and fittings and that would list out the codes of all the things so like tl or wc01 and then I, that would be my way of detecting if there was a toilet rather than having has toilet equals true or false right but what it, what it who was that? Okay. Um, so what that means though is we get this really bulky JSON file here that um, if I just quickly look at one of these items, it has the name of the uh, the name of the the item, an area. An ID, the ID is its Revit element ID, so if we ever need to use that, we can. Like, we want to specify a specific thing, but uh, in our CSS, we're good. Um, it has connecting rooms, it, has a to it doesn't have a toilet, etc., etc. So that is the analysis done. I don't need to teach you guys how to do this, because this is infinite, okay? The amount of analysis that you can do is insane. We can detect whether or not the door the door is in a certain part of the room, or if the room is on the north or the south or the east or the west. Like there's just so much stuff that you can analyze, and you need to understand that uh, eventually, if we're going to have a CSS system that runs well, that we either have to make that stuff we either have to analyze that stuff dynamically as the CSS runs, which is probably how it needs to be done. Um, for the for the future, but at the moment it won't like we, we're doing the analysis prior, yeah. Okay, and then I've got this this cluster, which is taking CSS and it's taking data, and if you double click into that, you will find a Python script, and if we double click into the Python script, we will find a very very empty Python script, because I've deleted all the stuff that I've written. Um, I've also got two two per, uh, panels, one with what looks like a JSON version of um, a CSS system, and the other looks more like CSS. It's got like question mark unit equals data, connect name, and then it's got um, curly brackets test equals true. So if you guys actually open up the... Uh, CSS component, copy that and paste it in, and plug our information into that instead. And look, I'm, I'm just going to uh, change the parameter on this. Oh, I need a password. So I'm going to change the one on the one that's not passworded to have a symbol. Jeez, so many symbols. Whatever, doesn't need it. Hmm? Pardon? 
Comp is the one that works. Oh. It's password protected, so you can't go and get the code yet. Um, and it will, but if you pl if you actually use that one, so I'm just going to call this one dev. So this guy here, if we actually read this CSS, is, and now um, I understand Jason actually mentioned this last week. Um, Jason, it's going to get a bit confusing with me calling you Jason and calling like files JSON, but you, you get it, right? Cool. I'm going to assume that's cool. He's like, huh? What an awful dad joke. Um, Jason mentioned last week, hey, isn't the benefit of CSS that one of the benefits that it is like a really simple way of writing if then statements and he's right. But that requires us to make really complicated parsing code to take a simplified like CSS syntax and convert it into something that's usable. So we today we're going to write our script to only run on um, JSON uh, version of it, and um, but the combined version will does actually sorry not combined the the component one that I sent you does actually run on text. So here what we what we're doing is and this is actually a bit jumbled just in terms of you know how it functions. We are we have a list so you can see that with the square brackets in that list. We have curly bracket. There we go. That's good. We have a curly bracket, so a, it's an object, and in that object we've got keys and values. So the key that uh, that we start looking at is the search function. So that is in in the search function there is a list. Um, so that means we can search multiple things in this one function. Um, and then in that, there is a text uh, object, which is Python. So in this case, this Python component is using the regex search function, and it is searching for unit in the... Um, that needs to change. That can't be cap all caps. It's looking for the, the name, it's looking for unit in data name. So just to clarify, we when we look at these objects, this dictionary of objects here, in our CSS script, we are going to refer to that object as a parameter, and that parameter is going to be data. Okay, so you know you pull out yeah, this this guy here. When we iterate over it, we're going to use the the variable data to refer to that. So any CSS search functions that we're writing that needs to refer back to that object is going to be called data. So that here we've got data name, and then we are going to change something in data, and we need to do that dynamically. So we've got a list of parameters that are going to be changed, and they're their dictionary of key and value. So the key is test and the value is true. And so in putting this in, we can see if we actually scroll down, we'll eventually, oh no, the top one was actually, the first one was a, a unit. You can see here this room um, called unit has now inherited the parameter test equals true, right? And if I scrubble down and find something that isn't a unit, such as, you know, let's look at the bottom. So this room here, so there's going to be a bathroom, it doesn't it doesn't have that test true on it, right? Does that make sense? So that's that's this is actually what we're going to build. And uh, look, I'll just demonstrate how this looks. Oh, uh, maybe no, if I do that, you guys can screenshot it. No, I won't do that. I do need, actually, I do need to look at it. Whatever, I don't care. I, I, I will need to refer back to this script. So we're going to jump, actually, do I? Yeah, let's just jump in. Let's just do it. So 
let's jump into Python. Come on, everyone in. You in? Yeah. Are you in? I don't think I have Rhino inside Revit. Okay, you need Rhino inside Revit. Um, what is the VS Code? So it, no. yeah. You've got it? Yeah, just you, it? You need to install it. Once you get Revit, mm -hmm. you'll also need to install this thing called Rhino inside Revit. Okay, go get it now. You can write this. We can write this without it, but you you'll need to get a copy of the the JSON file. So look, we've got two parameters coming in: CSS and data. And I just want to clarify a few things with you guys, just with um, writing uh, Python components in Rhino, a Grasshopper. These inputs have metadata associated with them. So CSS, I have set that to be list access. And I have also done the same with data. And um, is everyone clear about what that does? No? Okay, let me demonstrate. So at the moment, uh, X is assigned to be item access, and when I run my script, if I print the type of X and I print X and run, we can see that X is returning the fact that that, that 1 is a string and that 2 is a string, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I can actually zoom in. Sorry. Can we... Font options. Let's make. Size. Let make the yeah no. I know I'm I'm gonna get the size, but I'm also gonna use a better font. If I can. Okay. Thanks, Julio. It didn't like. It probably didn't like Roboto Mono. Um, what font was this? Comic Sans. It was near Comic Sans, wasn't it? It was Consola. I think that's it. I don't want to be bold. Consolas. There we go. Still the Prince shit. Okay. Um, cool thing about Grasshopper, um, Python over other pythons is that um, it can like if you print something it it actually comes out of the the out parameter so that's quite useful so you guys can see that as the print rather than this one right so we can see the first item has come out as a string and it's one and the second item has come out of string and it's, it's a two great now if i run that same script but we make the uh, the input a list access, um, then what is x as a variable now? Does it make sense? It's, it's, just, it's just made it to a list. It's turned it into a list. So item access means that the Python script just iterates over the items as single items, and list access means that it it takes all the branches as lists and works on them by themselves. But is this in the format of CSS, like CSS lists or something? This is just this is just Python. Oh, Python, Python lists. So that's yeah. why it can't like print out lists because it was going one by one. Yes. Oh my gosh, it was just one clip away. Oh yes. God, I hate it. Now one oh. one last thing. I did tell you this. No, it was for my um course last year. Okay. Yeah. So not this year. Not this year. Good. Okay. The, there is one last one that I have not delved into because it's actually a weird, complicated thing, but that's tree access, which um, if, you, if you run that, uh, hang on, that will actually take an object, like a, a multi-tier object like this. Does it, so no one explains this to you when you guys are learning Python. You're not learning Python in Rhino, right? No, 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 no,
Like we should have been doing tableau for that thing. Right, okay. So look, here's a here's a slightly complicated tree of data, you know, and so if I plug that in, then the the output is like it it sees that it's lists. Um uh, no that should be tree app. See, now what it's received is it's a data tree object. Right? And that's grabbing all the you're making a weird face. What that means is, huh? It's a lot of information. We don't, this is the thing, I haven't delved into that. I've never needed to. So I'm just making you aware that it exists. There's one other thing, when you right click these, there's a type hint. And I think I did explain this to you last term. So sometimes if Grasshopper kind of assumes the information you're putting into it, um, so if you put in, let's say, some geometry, it might think that you're just trying to work with its hash, that geometry's hash key. And so if it is giving you the wrong information in Python, uh, because, you know, a piece of geometry can actually be understood quite a few ways, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, then you can right-click this and you can pick make sure the geometry is understood a certain way. So in this case, if you've got points and they're coming out as weird hashes and you know that that input is only ever going to receive points, you can force it to accept points. Um, and we'll also just make that list uh, item access back again. And it will then error and say, I can't convert text to point, right? And so it'll, it'll add that sort of logic that Grasshopper puts in. You know, in Python, when like you try and add like add like these were all coming out as strings right like python thinks that it's strings grasshopper thinks it's strings but if i do a mass addition in grasshopper it's like i don't care yeah i'll add them all up it's 15 so grasshopper actually adds this safety layer at the beginning of scripts to convert things to how it wants and by changing the type hint so if i made this type hint now it was a string um here these are pumping out strings but if i say hey type hint make that a float then it forces all the types to be floats okay cool so th those are the you know that's the crunchy bits to know about doing python coding in um, Rhino or Grasshopper, sorry. How does the data output work? Uh, okay, so um, we can add parameters, either input or out, and the they are going to be um, they're going to be referenced in the Python script. So uh, if I just said, okay, here we've got C, like print CSS. Then that's going to hang on. Let's just set this up so that it's um. There's my print page. Cool. So if I print CSS, you can see that's the input. That's the CSS input, right? And it's actually a string. It's a string. It's a bunch of strings, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, and then the same with the output. So you can see that data, and I've defined data equals none, and therefore data is spitting out none. If I just said, hey, data equals A, then it's going to print, like it's going to produce. And that's why you can add multiple. <clears throat> yeah, so if you if you go through and add more, yeah, so, so. Then, then you then have to refer to that. And you can rename these here, mm -hmm. and then that then lets you access the that output through that. Huh? So there's just additional outputs, basically. Yeah, it, it lets you do it as many outputs as you want. There's only one issue that I can relate to, and that is that if when you pick item access, list, list access, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that's going to change the number of outputs you're going to receive. So in this case, these are all list accesses, which mean, and I've only got one branch going in to both inputs, so it's only going to produce one branch of an output. 
right? If I made this item access, look, it's run the script three times. It's literally said a e uh, data equals A and run that three times. And uh, because there's three items coming in via CSS, so it's it's but it's going to relate your data back to the branch structure. So um, if I graphed this, it's a grafted output. And so if you're going to make really complex scripts that need to do weird grafty outcomes, then you need to start learning about how to code Grasshopper's tree object. But as I said, you know that's 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 an uh, something to get into another day. Cool. So we'll take that back to list access. Um, the cool thing with the data output is it doesn't care what the object type is. Python, like if you've made an object, like I can say data equals a list with a in it, and I can also put the number five, and it's spat out a and five. Cool. <laughs> so we'll just take that back to none. So what are we doing? We are we are running CSS. And the CSS that we're receiving might be a bit crap. So, so for example, when I print the CSS, um, let's go get the output again, and let's type none properly. Jeez, we're gonna get through this class really quick. Okay, so what are we getting? We're getting a list and it's full of strings, right? This is not data, the, way, the same way that we've written it. I've written in, Grasshopper in the panel, a piece of like it's a JSON, right? But because this is receiving that information as strings, it thinks it's a string. So, first, what we've got to do is we've got to convert anything that is written like a string back into data, back into either, you know, an like whatever object it is. And this case is a dictionary or a list or whatever. And the JSON library in, in Python lets us do that. So, and you'll see, we might be using the JSON library a few times today. Um, there is a function called dumps, and there is a function called loads. And all these do is they, they, uh, they allow us to convert dictionaries and lists and variables in Python to strings and vice versa. So JSON dumps will convert actually let's uh, yeah that that's not going to do anything. It's going to look exactly the same when we print the ABC123. But that's now a string. Where's my, what's line 18? Okay, loads, obviously it's not running because it's got nothing in it. So, but that that's pretty simple. It converts it to a string. That's very useful if, like you, if you need to get your JSON out. So let me, let me demonstrate. Or your dictionary. So if I make, uh, you know, a a variable called D and make that dictionary that and then dumps D and then my data equals D uh, and then I stop that. So when Grasshopper goes to output D, it's outputting this thing called ABC. Right? Now what is ABC? Where did ABC come from? It's this key, right? It's this ABC key. So what what Grasshopper is doing is it's seeing, hey, I need to output a list, um, and uh, because dictionaries are iterable, then uh, it and if you iterate over a dictionary, you iterate over its keys. Just to remind everyone, um, then if we have multiple keys, it spits out the different keys in that dictionary. So if I said, hey, don't do that, spit out a, a list. It's, it's spitting out a, an object which is an iron python dictionary, right? It's not a string that is a JSON. It is an actual object. It's just, it's just like we're trying to 
drink water and oil at the same time and they're not mixing it's just they don't mix python is not grasshopper and grasshopper is not python and so if we want any information to, to travel between them like a dictionary then we've got to do something to that oil and that's a bad example ah because dictionaries are not um they're not sortable they they they're actually ran random in how they re how they represent themselves. Is that on the people? Huh? Is that on the topic? Wait, no. Tuples are on, you can't are immutable, right? Yes. So dictionaries are immutable, yeah. but they're also not sorted. Oh. So you can sort if I sort this dictionary and then go print it again, by sort sorting it does nothing to it. Okay. So and you'll find sometimes occasionally you might uh, rely on the sorting of a dictionary and then it fucks up, your order's all fucked up and that's because dictionaries don't sort. They don't sort alphabetically and there's no rhyme or reason to how they will spit out. It is just a, the reason that exists is so that it's easier to store the information in the RAM. Oh, so it doesn't need to like a set of words. Yeah. There are objects called ordered dictionaries but you have to load a library in to run that. Now we don't care about the order of um, this dictionary, okay. right? We're gonna re if we're gonna rely on any order, we have to rely on it to, in a list. Okay. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So if I if I dump D out as a list, then we get the string, right? There's the string of the JSON, and the same applies with loads. So I can load a string that looks like a JSON, and it will turn it into a dictionary. Yes. So when it outputs to you in the exit main every single time when you dump it. Yeah, the order will be random. So you can see here, it, well, in this case, it, random is a bad word. It, it is going to come out the same each time based on how the computer thinks it should come out. So it might be based on cycles or the way the RAM's running, but it's, it's just decided, okay, key is easier to store in the RAM first. And then A, B, C. So if I change the string on the computer, it will be different. Yep, might be. Okay. Might be different is the key. Yeah, we are actually. We are, it's almost like we're working with quantum. Is it's like an uncertainty thing. We no, we're uncertain how a JSON will. I mean, a, a dictionary will return, right? It doesn't. The thing is, you can't rely on it being in an order. So never, never do that. Yeah, and I've made that mistake. And I've been like, why is my script not working? It's because I'm relying on the order of a dictionary. You, you, know, you finally work that out. It's like, so you, shit. So if you're trying to grab something, you can just go through it directly by the variable? If you, want, if you want to run through a dictionary alphabetically, let's say, then you would first convert the dictionary to a list, which will get rid of all the keys and just give you, I mean, sorry, all the values and just give you the keys um, you then sort the keys, then you iterate over the keys and access the dictionary and you say, give me the value of this key and then this key and then this key. And that's exactly what an ordered dictionary does, um, but it's just built into a single object. Cool. So, yeah, there's once you learn how Python works, you then have to work within its bounds. Yeah. So, JSON loads, we can run that on CSS. Now, the only problem is CSS can be multiple strings. So prior to us running that, we are going to join CSS. So we're just going to say, hey, join CSS and, and replace the variable with it. So let me just print this for you so you can see what it's doing. Jeez, it's so hard teaching Python. It's like a, it's a different mindset, isn't it? So if I print CSS to begin with, I'm getting it's giving me a list of all these items because we because of that's the way it's input, and they're all strings. And then by joining them with an empty character, it it just concatenates that all into a single string. Um, and then this JSON loads component is converting that to a um, a dictionary so if I just quickly print 
Um, C CSS and it's t or at least it's type. Then that's coming in as a. L that's not right. Yeah, that's coming as a list, which it should be. Right, so it's converted it to a string and now it's a list. And so I can technically say, hey, go give me um, CSS item zero. And item zero is actually like a dictionary, which is that search function. Cool. So we, need, we also need to do that with our data because just in case someone's, you know, typed a JSON instead, that we've got to we've got to run that um, properly. So I've forgotten what my variable name is. It's data. That's probably not a good thing. But whatever. You, you usually don't want to repeat information, which I've I've made a bad mistake there. So we'll just call this. Um, I'm going to rename this to models. And so we're going to clean that up. We're going to CSS join it and then load it. So models equals and we can also clean this particular line up into this so we can write it as a single line does that make sense there's a there's like an efficient way of writing python but then there's also like a teachy way of writing python yeah okay so now what we could do is we can iterate. Oh, also, let's just do one other thing. I'm going to leave the cluster. And just after this listify, just before this listify component, uh, I'm going to use a list item. And we're just going to list out like two objects so that when we're writing the script, we're only running it on two objects, right? So that way we don't have to you know, run it on, on 50 and potentially confuse the confuse ourselves. So we'll run it on two. So then whilst running this, it's it's not going to kill kill our brains. And I, I should close that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. My bad. I'll get us back to where we were. Okay, that's running. Cool. So, um, what we need to do now is we need to run through each object. And then when we run through each object, we then need to run through the CSS. Which are the objects again? They're the rooms. So, do you want me to use the term room instead? No. Okay, well, yeah, so we're going to run through each model. So, we've got a list of models. And we're going to run through them. So we're going to say four. Now, this is the critical thing. We've we've agreed, or well, I've forced you to use the term data to refer to the model. So for data in models. And we'll just quickly print data just to demonstrate what we're getting. And we'll then run that. So those are our two. Uh, JSON objects that we've we've imported then per data object we want to run through the CSS now this is really fucking heavy for really big data sets and really big CSS but it's it's pretty it's pretty quick okay so for uh, for and we'll just refer to our CSS line as CSS line in CSS let's print CSS line just so you can see what I'm referring to I've only written one line of CSS so this should this should run and if I run my data first there's my data and then the uh, last thing I'll do is I'll put a little end line on so we can see what's what's going on there we go there's my data, there's the CSS object, and then we, we run again. 
there's the next object and then there's that CSS object. If there was 10 CSS lines, there would be 10 per data item, right? So first thing we can do, is everyone up kind of, you're up to scratch with what's going on? Yeah, it's just a lot of information taking a long time. Yeah, so why we, so why, now that we've done this, what we're doing is we're effectively cross-referencing, right? We're saying, we want you to check every one thing with every other one thing in the other list. Because we, we have no idea whether or not they apply or not, and so we have to do that. And that's, that's actually what your browser does every time it runs CSS. It's checking every object against the CSS, and then if it satisfies, it applies the CSS to that object. Yeah? It's doing it pretty quick as well, right? Like there are some websites that have quite a lot of stuff on them. So it's it's an efficient layer of code. Um, Cause it, yeah, there's the actual process of, of searching a document. So if I said, hey, go find every door or every room that satisfies this condition, we would still have to do it that way. We still have to iterate over the model to find that stuff so that this is, we're just doing this in a way that's oriented towards per object um, analysis. Cool? Okay. So once we've once we've run this, uh, sorry, once we're iterating through each one, now because we're hitting this, um, and I'll just hide the, um, oh no, I'll leave the data up. We've hit this data, and then what we want to do is we want to say, hey, search for this condition and there's actually there could be multiple so we have to iterate over the searches always and this is i want to make really clear to you guys always try and write your code as if there might be more than one thing right because if you write it as if there's only one thing then you've now limited yourself to only being able to do one thing with that code so codes that work on multiple things should also be able to work on one but codes that are only made to work on one thing We'll only ever work on one thing. Cool? So I've put my searches as a list because that allows me to have multiple searches. I could say, hey, if the name of this the name of this room is unit or the name of it is corridor or the name of it is back of house corridor or we can write that all into a list rather than having to write uh, that as Python. Which, so it's just saving us typing or, I understand that, but it means that we can iterate over that better. So, how do I explain this in the most simple way? If, so, now that we've hit the CSS, I know we're doing a lot of iteration, four data in models, four CSS line in CSS, we now have to go for Let's go search in a CSS line search, right? So that's that's referring to this object and the search is referring to that key and this is going to iterate over that list. So if I just get rid of the print CSS line and instead print search, Uh, what have I done wrong? I need to put a little um, colon on that. Huh? Am I going too fast? No. Okay. So cool. So that's now printing that as a string, right? You can you can see that, right? I'm just um I don't usually teach Python, so I'm just trying to make sure that I'm going at a pace that's okay. And I, I know at this point I've been quite fast, but we're going to slow down because we're about to hit something complicated. Do you remember what I explained to you guys last week? This can be that that is a string that represents Python code. And we can actually run Python code. And we can run strings as if they're Python codes. Do you remember how I said, like, if you do this, you're effectively allowing people to just turn your computer off? Right? That's this code. So this is Python. This re.search uh, unit data name, blah, 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 that's all Python. So if I just quickly say, okay, there's the search function. 
and we're just going to get uh, the result. And the result is the evaluation of search. Huh? Scary. You said don't, don't use evaluation. I said don't use it. The reason I, I was saying don't use it was because we're about to use it. Look, the first thing anyone gets taught at Dynamite School is don't use Dynamite. Right? Don't use a bomb. But now we're going to teach you how to use a bomb. Safety. Yes. The, the most important thing to learn about evaluation the evaluate code is that it is fucking dangerous okay but what we are what and we're in a safe environment okay you're not going to write code that hacks your computer like i'm not going to write code that hacks my computer and um paolo's not going to write code that hacks um russell's computer because russell's not going to get paolo's code are you no. right Exactly. Paolo, if people are asking you for, for, for code, make sure you hack their computer. No, don't do that. It's illegal. Um, now, the thing is we have to use it. If we were just making this code to be distributed, we would actually have to rely on the, the fact that we want people to write CSS the way the the text way, because by doing that, we can then layer into that the safety net so that when we use eval, eval is receiving instructions from our code, not from people inputting code. So they can't change it. Yeah. So they can only, they, they can only code within the bounds of what we've allowed, right? So just to, as an example, some websites in the old days used to write have PHP scripts that would send the like a direct SQL call to a database and so you could type into the database SQL and you could put like end conditions so you could say end that code in that particular function now run this function and that message would then get sent to the database with, within the protected version of the code and the person would then receive like a dump of all the administrative passwords, for example. They could say, forget what you were just doing. Don't give me the eBay, don't give me eBay item 224. Instead, give me all tables from eBay, from the database. And that would then give them the tables and then they'd go, okay, change that. Now, just give me this particular table which has everyone's password. Great, download that. And if, the, and if they had stored passwords in a really dangerous way, then now that hacker has everyone, every user's password or potential credit card number through that. And so that, that's the exact same system, that eval is that dangerous thing. So that's what I'm just saying, this is dangerous stuff. And we're going to use it because we're in a safe environment. Cool. I don't, I've made that really clear, right? Good. Cool. So by running eval and putting the string of ser uh, the search string into that, and then I'm just going to put in the result. That's going to return. Um, Is that what I wanted it to do? Why is it around the wrong way? Oh no, that's right. So it, that's now printing. There's a string, and it's also printing the fact that there is a match. So that match object is actually the the return thing. And we're we're relying on, um, in this case, we're relying on Python's ability to determine none objects as false and existing objects as true. So that's also as if we were, you know, saying that's true. So uh, let me just put that into a, can I go boolean? We'll just convert that to a boolean. Cool. So that's returned a true for that item, right? So by iterating over that, we've returned a true. Now, if I had multiple search conditions, 
we only want to apply the parameters if one of them runs, right? If, I'm sorry, comes out true. If we had multiple coming out true, then we would have an issue because then the script would run multiple times. We don't want it to run multiple times. So rather than writing like if result do, do thing, instead, what we'll do is we'll put a blanket uh, a blanket parameter at, at the beginning of the search, which says run, uh, like apply parameters. And apply parameters is always going to be false to begin with, right? So we don't want to apply parameters unless something comes up true. Do you know? Do you see where I'm going? Just want to see. Yeah, so after I've done the for loop, I can then say if apply parameters, and then we'll, we'll do the, the application of parameters there. So during this search function, the result is going to get applied to that apply parameters. So, and if I have a false value and a true value, what's an easy way of making sure that the outcome is always true when I combine those two together? So logic functions, guys. You remember them? I'd like everyone in this room to put up their hand if they have blonde hair. Okay. I would like everyone in this room to put up their hand if they have blonde hair or they're a dickhead. No one else is putting up their hands. What? There's no other dickheads in the room? Ah, uh, get it. <laughs> Do you see what I've done? Yeah. Sorry, it's a joke. No, it was because you were blonde, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I so or means it applies to everyone. So I want everyone to put up their room if they're blonde or they're male. That's everyone, right? Now, if I want, I want you to put up your hand if you're blonde and you're male. Right. Do we get ands and ors? Right. So if I have a true and a false, and I want them to come out true, what do I use? Do I use and or do I use or? Correct. Right. So if we want to combine two Boolean functions in Python, the the book and we want to make basically make them a uh, comparison as we set a uh, variable. We can say apply parameters equals apply parameters or which is that vertical line result. I like that. By the way, I really like that dickhead trick. It's quite fun. I'm going to use that. I haven't done that before. Maybe it's because I know you guys well enough. I will, I'll apply, I'll, it's a good one. It's a good example. Um, apply parameters equals apply parameters or result. So if this is true, I mean, so if this is false, then it's always going to come out as, uh, sorry, it's, it's potentially going to come out as false. When this be result becomes true, then apply parameters gets changed to true. And it's only, it's only then. So you could run through a hundred of the search functions and then suddenly hit one of them that's true and then that gets turned to true. Cool? So apply parameters. It's going to hit, tr it's going to come out true because um, this search functions come up as true. So we wanted that now run through all the keys and values and apply them to the dictionary. The, now, there are easy ways of doing this. We could have just written a dictionary of all the parameters and applied that dictionary. And the, the way that you do that is through this function called update. So I'll just demonstrate update for you. Yeah. You've seen update? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> in a in a set or in your time later, you just like do like a quick like drawing or something just like all the data where you make your way out like sure. Sure. Let me just show you update and then I'll do that, okay? 
So I've got a dictionary and that dictionary is A equals B. And I have an update dictionary which is uh, C equals D. And if I print D, it's, it hasn't changed, obviously. A equals B. Um, the way that you can combine two dictionaries together easily is by using this thing called update. So we can say uh, D dot update, and I, I can't remember if I'm going the right way or not. D dot update U is going to apply U to D. And so in doing so, it is now added C and D to, to that dictionary, right? Cool. Now, if, I've, if I do this, A equals C, well, let's go X, then it overwrites the initial system, okay? So we could just really quickly just use that to apply our, our CSS. The only reason I haven't written my system that way is because I want to be able to have the, the ability to do other things other than just overwrite. So I've written mine so that you can put special little characters in and allows you to append information. So rather than it saying, okay, here's, here's a bunch of classes and I'm going to replace those classes with a new class, instead I can attach it to the end. And we're not going to do that right now. Um, hang on a sec. Um, we're not going to create that crazy system right now, but we might as well at least code that part because that's the syntax that I'm using. Do you know? So let me just demonstrate what I mean. And um, <laughs> fuck you. Uh, no. Okay, cool. Um, I, I want to ask about um, the earlier functions with false or false. Pardon? So just in Kylie said we were iterating over false or false or false, false here true, true, right? Yep. But what happens if it goes false or false or false true and then to false false? Right. So what's true versus false in an OR function? True or false? What's the answer? Okay, so you've got you're comparing true, you're comparing false and false, yeah. right? False or false is false. no, no false or false. false. So if you are female or you are uh, a redhead, um, put up your hand. No one has satisfied the female and no one has satisfied redhead, mm -hmm. so they're both false. Mm -hmm. So did anyone put up their hand? So it's both false. Or false is false, right? Yes. Now, it, female or black hair, false or true, mm -hmm. means that it's no false or true is true, true right? <laughs> so, but, um, hang on. <laughs> Okay. <sighs> I don't think I've. No, I do. I probably do have paint. I haven't used paint in a while. Like, I'd open it and be like, oh, it's changed so much. No, it looks different. Oh, 
<sighs> Come on, you bitch. Sixty-four gigs of RAM. Huh? What do you mean? I upgraded it. It comes with sixteen. Huh? Yeah. I well because it's a work computer, I had to get a technician to do it. I'm not. I'm. I'm not certified technician according to my work. Also, at, when I did get it upgraded, you couldn't buy uh, 32 bit, uh, 32 gig slots of RAM in Australia for that slot. So I had to get them to order it. So I went to like, you know, a Chinese guy who could get it from China. Because this is the thing. The other thing, I was like, I could find websites that were selling it, and I'm like, uh, like, I can't, I don't trust this website. You know. Huh? It's like I really don't know if the, like if I bought this, am I actually getting thirty two gigabytes RAM? That's the type of websites I was finding. Because I like I huh? Because I I think the the thing is um. Okay. Um. Actually, let's do it like this. Let's make a nice little drawing. So, sorry, I, I really just need to make sure clear that you guys understand logic functions. I know some of you know what we're talking about. So, black is false, white is true, yeah. right? And we're gonna. There's a symbol which is. True versus true, true versus false, uh, false versus false. Uh, and I also want to make it very clear, false versus true, false versus false. Okay. And the result for those, this symbol here means and, yeah. and this me means or. I'm I'm only looking at you. Because it's not. There are there are people here that that said the wrong answer before, and I'm I'm not just look, focusing on you. Okay, so true and true is always going to be true, and true or true is always going to be true. Right? True and false is always going to come out false. And true or false is going to come out true. And the same applies the other way. The order, the direction doesn't matter. Okay? It's not subtraction, it's multiplication. Think of it as one times one, one times zero. Zero times one. They always come out as zero. Right? Zero? This is or is one plus zero. So it's going to be one, right? And then logically, these are always going to be false. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're iterating through a big list and we've got false, 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 false versus true. False versus true, which is this guy here, it's going to result in an or as true. And then false, 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 false again. Well, the tr that false is now turned to a true. So now it's it's actually doing this that this line for every other every other run. So even though it's hitting false, 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 because we've converted that that false to a true, it's now it's going to stick as a true. Yeah. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. I should make a little diagram, like like a prettier version of this to get to people. Yeah. Now, to get back to what you were asking for, Tom, 
Um, we have, uh, this is going to be awful. We have a room, a, oh, by the way, our, our lecture's meant to end at, at four o'clock, right? Do you want to continue it to five? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've got a room. It's got parameters on it. Yeah. We've got CSS lines and these CSS lines could have multiple search values and they can also have multiple keys and parameters associated with it. And we're effectively just We're, we're, oops. We've written code that's just iterating over this. And when it hits this, it then checks these. And when it checks these, it checks, like, it checks through all of those. Boop, 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 boop. Like a, it's just a layer of iteration. Yeah? We're just three layers deep now. What we've done is we've we've said okay iterate, so we're we we've just we just finished iterating over these guys, and if any of them came came out true, let's say that one came out true, then we're going to apply this. As long as one of those came out true, we're going to apply this. Now this is constructed as a key and a value parameter, rather than a key versus a value. And that's purely because I've made it that way so that we can make more complex things later, if you want. We've just, we've just, I've just made a data set that allows the broadest spectrum of power to us. So to apply parameters, all we have to do is iterate. So you can see here, bu -bu 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 -bu, Let's print um, print CSS line again. We'll get rid of that print. So we've searched this guy, and then see update. Update ha is now a list as well, and it's just a bunch of dictionaries with a key and a value. So if apply parameters, then we run for uh, update uh, for you in well we could call this update in CSS line update and we need to put a little colon at the end of that then we've got a bunch of variables that we can apply so data I'm just going to do this as an example. Data key equals data value. Now I'm going to I'm going to throw this to you guys, and we need to make that equals. So do you remember what data is? Where is it? Where is it in my script? Look, it's actually highlighting it. You're right. But look, I've just got some people shaking their heads and some people saying they know. So see data. We've got up here data. So it's the room, right? It's the model. I'm saying data variable. Sorry, and then we don't need this. This is complicated. Data variable, and that variable we've defined as key, equals value. So... If I just quickly run this, and uh, let's say just after apply parameters, we say print data, and we'll not print data up there. Uh, pass, we don't need that. You can see, see there's data, and 
there's key and there's value, right? So this, this notation allows us to put any variable as a dictionary, like in the dictionary, and then make that equal to a variable. And that, so this variable could be anything, right? If I made that anything, then blah, 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 random dictionary order, anything equals value, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use a, an, another dictionary's value to define the key that we're changing. So the update dictionary, which is this guy, this, this thing, we're going to use the key. So uh, the update object, the parameter key is going to return test. So we're going to change test on our dictionary, on our room, and we're going to change that to be the update dictionary's value. So if I run this now, test equals true, which is what we've written into the CSS. Can you see that? See, see look, I've said if unit is in the name, then update the key test and make the value true. Right? And look, test equals true. So, we've actually basically finished the base level of the script. It's done. So, if I just quickly whip out of here, oh sorry, the last thing I've got to do, it's not done. Um, we've got to chain, we've got to set our data output as models. Uh, models, so we've got to print that as a JSON. So uh, JSON dot dumps models. And now there, there's the string, there's, that's the output. Um, and the easiest, we want to be able to work on this. So We'll do we'll do that work after. We'll just make sure this is actually like, this is a nice clean Python workflow, and we'll turn this into a non-clean Python workflow in a moment. So, so here, test equals true because unit um, is in the name. See what we've got written here. But if we said you know let's change that now to uh, comments equals hotel bedroom, whatever, that's now applied, where is it, comments, hotel bedroom, yeah, and I could say, okay, let's grab that search function and let's make a duplicate one, and for some reason, let's also make any room called room also have that, and now if we run that on our full data set, Sorry, that listifier needs to be the correct one. Then if we get to the bottom of here somewhere, we're going to have um, name is room and comments, 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 comments equals hotel bedroom. Okay? So uh, I'm very certain that everyone here in person did not write any Python just now because I can see, unless you have some connection between your brain and your computer none of you did any typing whilst I talked okay what I need you to do over the next week is I want you to write this Python code okay and it's not perfect okay there are some things in there that aren't going to work properly potentially and I'll, you're going to find out if that happens based on exploring. Okay, let's do a little bit of exploring with my code and actually start applying some CSS to the Revit model. Okay, so 
one of the things that we were going to do really easily is say that a room's name is going to change to toilet if there is a toilet in the room okay so let's write that css i'm gonna i'm gonna just move this dev thing out the way and turn it off and we're going to use my my comp uh, my um component we're going to write uh, this CSS file from scratch. So, we're going to have a search function and we're going to have an update function. And the update function needs a key and the update function needs a value. I'm using the wrong syntax here. The update dictionary should have a key and a value. Okay, so do you remember You've all got the script in front of you. Do you remember what parameter we want to use to work out if something has a toilet in it? It's in front of you. Yeah. What did I what's what did I set as the parameter on the model? If there's a toilet sign fiction in the Yeah, what's the parameter called? What did you say? Yeah, has toilet, right? So data has toilet equals true, right? Now, guess what? Data has toilet is basically a true false value so that's going to return a true false I think let's just double check has toilet equals false right so it's going to return a true false value no matter what that's really simple code just go get that value if it's a true false value use that if it's not then it's going to fail and the key that we're going to change is the room name so we'll call call that name. Uh, I think I've done it as a lowercase thing. And the value is, um, we're going to call it a toilet. And if we plug that into my CSS, then, and I've just done this so that it's a bit easier to read. Look here, uh, most of these aren't going to work, are they? Because I haven't drawn toilets into them. Ah, oh, that's right. Let's do this as well. There's another condition. Do you remember I said, hey, if the room is only connected to a unit, then it is also definitely a toilet. We can write that as a second condition to search for. Right? So if someone puts a toilet or someone puts um, a, room huh? a, a room inside a unit, it will become toilet. Yep. So, huh? So the parameter that I've used for that is called um, connect name, and connect name is a list. And so if we want to do a, if we can do some cool operations on lists to get true false values, because um, because it's it's a parameter. That's the connect just means like connections. So the this room is connected to a this particular room is connected to another room called room and another room called corridor. And I've also got parameters connect class and connect tier. But we're not going to use them right now. We're just going to use the name. So if I have a list I can use a function called in to see if the thing that I'm looking for is in that list. So the string unit in data connect name, if it's underscore, right? Yep. So 
if unit shows up in there, then this will also be applied. Um, that's not going to work. We don't. So why is why might this not work? Look, let's go look. So I'll look at the. I'll go look at all my rooms. Name equals room. Has connect name equals unit. That's going to work, right? But if I just whip up here a bit. Uh, no, it's the um, this guy. This is the corridor that connects to all the units, right? So this is this is not going to work. What we want is we want to say a list with unit with only unit in it equals data connect name, and then that will come up true for only toilets. Yeah. Have I got this right? Key equals name value equals toilet. Please work. Why are you not working? Why is that still coming up as room? Unit. Connect name, data, blah, 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 blah. Let's just do this. Name toilet. Okay, my little script isn't letting you overwrite existing things. Like, what I'm saying is, let's say something's been named room, and then I've got, um, I don't want that to be overwritten by the CSS. So we've got to work, we've now got to write our script so that we force the CSS to over override it so the way that we can do that is by saying like new name and that new names come in toilet so now we can go through and apply any new values to the Revit model based on that so let's do that um, have you guys can you guys have this like up like we're now going to do grasshopper -y stuff. Like you should be able to follow along better. So, uh, do you want me to put this CSS? I'll put it on Slack, and I'll make a Slack channel. And I have to add certain people to Slack, right? There's not everyone's on here. This is code. 20, 21, 2020, right? 2120. 2120? Yeah. That's right. Cool. Um, can you two come up and type your emails in? Um, and can... Uh, those of you new on the internet, so Sean, actually, you don't just put your uh, put your emails into um, the chat. Sean, yeah, should it just be Sean and maybe are you iPhone? Oh, your iPhone. Okay, cool. Then everyone else, um, I will put a link on previous terms Slack to get access to this. Actually, you should be able to just get into it through Slack. It's a it's a public channel. How do you do it? Huh? You just go like search it. Thanks, Sean. I'll show you in a second how to connect. Actually, I can do this, can't I? Uh, I should be able to just... 
uh, invite people with a link, right? Yeah. Oh no, I can't. Yeah. I don't have the premium Slack, maybe that's why. Okay, that's the three of you. Yeah, it's there. It's yeah, just a. It just... Yeah, it's in the channels. You should be able to see it. Yeah, I'll type something in there. So this is the CSS. Is it twenty or ten? Uh, it's twenty one twenty. You guys got that? Yeah. Cool. Pardon? It's on Slack. It's 2120. Do you need me to... I don't need to. It's public. But if you need help, I will... Okay, cool. Oh, Chunlin Fu, I forgot about you. My apologies. You can just add each other now. If someone can't get on, just add each other, right? Um, there's the CSS. You can copy that into that little thing. Into here. Um, we have a problem in that... So this is producing a nice Python list, but it's not making a nice um, grasshopper list, right? We want to be able, like, for example, it's provide, it's giving us a um, like a line per piece of text, like key and value, and that's going to be a bit messy. So we we are going to go back into Python just for a moment, but I need you all to write this Python, okay? So we're going to make a new Python component. We're going to make the first input J. That's going to be our information. And we're going to have an output which is like L, which will be a list. We want the J input to be list access. So we're going to import JSON because we need to use that to convert stuff from strings back to uh, from strings to objects and and whatnot. Um, and the what the way that we're going to do this is the shortest way possible. 
we're going to tell this component to give us certain values. So first, first thing we need to join that just like we did in the previous script. So we're going to say j equals um, empty join j and we're going to wrap that all in um, a json.loads and that's going to reconstruct our, our list and dictionary. I'm going to do this really slowly so I need you guys to follow this because your script's not going to run unless you do this. Okay. All good. Okay. I'm excluding you from the from the, the chase then. Okay. Then we are going to ask it to give us. We're going to say give us a key. So in this case, the key is uh, anything that has new in it. Why is this erroring? Name is not defined. What? Name J is not defined. Ah, oh, it needs to be a capital J. Cool. So we're gonna I'm I'm not gonna explain this to you too too much. I'm just gonna give you a really, really quick um, piece of code. That code is going to be L equals list map lambda x x bracket uh, no shit it's not gonna work we're gonna make sorry out uh, out op equals list shit that's not going to work either okay we we will write we will write that um, map k in the x and then the list that we're going to uh, run our lambda function, our map function on, is going to be j. And then we close this off and we hit test. And it doesn't find true, but whatever. Uh, so we also want, we want that in a try. And we want an accept pass. Ah, oh, you bastard. Okay, we are going to have to write this out of equals list for i in j i'm going to copy this to you guys okay because i'm just i'm just going to type this out and then i'm going to copy it to you for i and j um if uh, try out of dot append i K except out of dot append none. L equals out of. Excellent. So this is going to basically give us new name. Bloop. Okay. This is. So we put we put our JSON in, we tell it what we want it to give us, and it will just give us a list of all the um, the the parameters that have ch that have that that those objects have. And if the object doesn't have it, then it's going to give us a null. And I'm going to copy all of this to you guys right now. Um, so you should be able to just paste that into your paste that into your thing, just make sure that the J is set to a list access function, right? Now, the beautiful thing about this is that it's in the same order as the rooms that have been queried from Revit. 
So this list over here This guy these rooms are in the same order so there's 29 rooms and there is 29 variables to change so do, do you see where I got that from I got huh so there are there are we're querying rooms in Revit I'm taking the output of the E and I am um, I'm using that in conjunction with this list of variables. So new name equals toilet and we've got a bunch of rooms and you can see here room 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 are all rooms that we're going to change the toilet. Right? Actually, I'm going to make sure toilet is in all caps. Now, if I and if I do this, if I go and grab Revit and say, "Hey, um, set element," and I put these elements in, and I type name, and I plug that into K, and I plug all of these in, it's going to erase all the names from the document except for toilet. So what we need to do is we need to find all the nulls and we'll do that by using uh, this component. Uh, you want bifocals, wouldn't you? We, we use this component called null item, which will tell us a true or false value on whether or not the item is a null. It's true if it's null. And we use that to dispatch the list of names to change. And we can also use that to dispatch the list of rooms to change. So we want the, the names and the rooms coming out of uh, B. So those are the names and these are the rooms. And we can then plug our rooms into the set element parameter. We can plug uh, the parameter name into set element parameter and we can plug the values and in doing so it will immediately bake that to, to uh, Revit and check that out we've just converted all of our toilets into toilets uh, sure this one or this one? Is this set to list item, list access? What does the little bubble say? It's probably it's probably erroring. Huh? Uh, this the CSS. You know this, the this thing that we're running. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh, this is going to be fun. So while you're doing that, I'm going to just have a go because I haven't tried this yet. I'm going to put a wall in here. And then I'm going to put a door. And then I'm going to put a room.
And then I'm going to hit F5. Didn't like me. Huh? So I put the, the data into the, the maps and then I put it into the hosker and if I put it into the script it doesn't work. If I put it straight in What? My cluster doesn't work. Sorry. Is this mine or yours? Uh this is yours. Yes. You have mine. Do you, do you have mine? Uh no. Oh, is it? No, there's a new one. Hmm? I just. Yeah. There's the one I've written that I'm not sure it's true. Okay. I'm very well, confused with, with all the iterations. Well, there's the one. That's this. All the way down. That one. Oh, so that's the code that works. Right? Um, I want you guys nope. to have a go at making. Yeah. Can I just go back to see your final connection? You can. So look, this is this is uh, not the best way of writing this code because we've got to now write code to go and work out. I'll go find new name and then if it's got new name then apply it. What we would want is like a system to detect changes and make them apply to the Revit model. Okay, so that that's giving you guys a little seed to do that. Yeah. So is that running for everyone or someone or whatever? Where's that data connected from again? Which data? Um, the one that's wet. It's connecting to from rooms. rooms the the on. element the elements coming out of query elements. Okay. So do you wanna write some more CSS? Once everyone's running? I'm just gonna sneak into it. Hmm. So, um, you mean the first assignment? I want the fir first assignment is you're going to build the the Python code in that cluster up to be better, and you're going to need to do that by finding out some things. Like you're gonna to have to go apply some, try and write some CSS and see what's right and what's wrong with your code. So using this sandbox, you can go add parameters to this to this building. Hello, Kathy. I'm just. Is no. Is this super important? Yes. Yeah, the the spreadsheet I've given you allows you to do that. You can change. Uh, I'm not sure about profit. Uh, I didn't program in profit, but you can definitely. Um, there's a drop down in that spreadsheet to let you change from fee to cost and, and whatnot. Can, can I can I can I call you back? Um, is it is it okay for me to call you back around five? Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay. That gave you some time to catch up, right? Yes, this is getting 20 Pardon? 
Yeah, that's. Oh no, you want the ones coming out of B. Yeah. Because not... when I went from A, uh, when I went from B, it was like not, not from the same. Right. Look. See all of these. You want the ones coming out of B, because the ones coming out of A are the ones that are not null. Hmm. Are you searching for name or new name? I'm searching for new name. Um, you, and look, the null item, you, there's no way it's going to be coming out of A. You want it coming out of B. And if it comes out null, that's fine. That means there's nothing to change. <laughs> yeah, that means it's empty. So if I, if I use that, oh, it's his computer, not mine. Oh, yeah, yeah. If I use A, it comes out quite a bit. Not B. No, no. All of these are null. Yeah. This thing is not producing any changes. Like none of them are none of them are coming out as with a new name. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. Right? Th that means that this that means that this is not producing an outcome that we're looking for. So data, search for data has toilet. And we go into Revit. Apparently none of them had toilets according to what Revit said. Right? So look, all of these are false. Oh, there's one true. Eighteen is true. True. Ah, has toilet is under um oh, it's underscore. Oh, no, it's under no, 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 no case. Check it out. Toilet. Ah. Toilet. Room. And it's not being applied. So that guy's a toilet. Oh, so I just did the. It's just the variable was, was wrong. Oh, okay. That's cool. Okay. So it worked. Yeah, yeah it worked. But it has, obviously hasn't worked on these guys. So check this out. If we go add a component, and it, we add a toilet to that. Wow. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah? Oh, wow. Thank you. This is mind blowing. <laughs> So what's the deal with like the one where you like create a room? What? So that one you added a toilet. Uh, I had to rerun the script, right? Yeah. It's because it's because some the, look the connection between Rhino Inside and Revit isn't perfect, mm -hmm. and so there are occasions where you have to go prod Rhino Inside. Mm -hmm. So, like all of these guys are toilets, and like if I del if I go and delete this, um, and I change that, and I delete that, blah 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 blah. Um, what do I do? Wait, so, so you've got two, two variables which is if it has a toilet or if it's a room. Yes. Okay. So if I if I delete this room, it's gone. If I add a room now, it might not run. Yeah, that's kind of like how with the other room. Right, but watch. Now, if I do anything, like if I change the door... It might update, it might, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, couldn't that mean sometimes it will automatically update something you don't want? Well, yeah, that's that's why I've made like you, you the you have you, the script is doing this. You're in control of the script. Yeah. 
So if you're worried that it's going to change something you don't want, like let's say I, I'm adding for some reason a walk-in robe here, then my CSS is wrong, right? The CSS can't rely now on the fact that it is a room, a room like connected to a unit. It has to, I, we have to go get rid of that from the CSS. Mm -hmm. So w the only re reason we wrote that was because in this particular situation, um, it's okay. But uh, for this example, you gonna change? Cool. Okay, so we've got a bunch of rooms that need departments. So for example, corridor, if if corridor is in the name, it must be in the circulation department. Or um, if it's a cleaner's room or if it's a plant room, it needs to be in the back of house. Blah 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 blah. Also, certain we could we can write um, areas. So if a unit is of a certain size. So I'm just going to jump over. There's a there's another floor plan here called tier. Um, and it's got it's going to color the tiers of the of the rooms. And we might the rule set might just be hey, um, if a room is of a certain size, it's just a it's a higher tier. You know, we've made big fat rooms, they're going to be five star rooms, and we've made small room, it's going to be a three star room, or a two star room, or a one star room, like my, my place. Um, so, let's write that. I actually, we've got an idea of all the areas, I'll just quickly go find them out. They're going to be in millimetres, unfortunately. Sorry, when I say millimetres, they're going to be in millimetres squared. So it looks like, you know, we can sort of do this, put this around, um, let's sort it as well. You guys don't need to do this. Um, so 11,000, <laughs> don't turn that off, don't turn that off, that's mine. Well, not this part, but this part, let's do this part. So, yeah, you really don't want to piss me off. Okay. So, we're going to add a new line to our CSS. We're going to say, hey, if the room's name is unit, just like we've got here. Oh, sorry, no, that's, uh, this is a different CSS. My bad. Here we go. We're going to search for data has toilet. No, we want data name equals unit. I understand this might be a bit messy to look at, so look, let's just do this. Let's copy this over to Sublime. Yeah, this is going to be the CSS. This is part of the CSS. So data name equals unit and we want to look for a certain area but let's let's do let's write this like css every unit 
needs to have a certain tier, right? So immediately we'll say key uh, new tier equals, and we'll say the, the minimum tier for our rooms is tier three, right? That's going to apply a tier to every unit. And then if the name is unit and the data area is greater than one seven four two five one seven six uh one seven six one two three four five then its tier value is going to be four okay so i'm going to copy this back in and you can see why maybe writing css makes it easier like writing actual see like the css type will make it easier but in this case we'll just keep it going and we want to go find out new tier and that's going to give us the tiers for all the rooms right so they're only coming out as three so uh, maybe i made this number too big or too small There we go. So if you make it one, seven, three, and then five zeros, then that's going to give you a mixture of fours and threes for those rooms, right? And what we're going to do is we just, we'll actually just copy all of this down. We're going to change the input of this to be tier. And we're going to change the new name to be tier as well. And what we will find is that's now applied uh, automatic tiers to our rooms based on their areas. Okay, do you see where we're going? Yes. Okay, I want you guys to keep, like, just keep going at this. Write some CSS. See, oh, what can I do? If I add more toilet, like, if I add more toilets, like, look, if I add a toilet to a, um, if I add a toilet to this room, what happens to it? It's going to become a toilet, right? Or is it? Okay. Just see what happens. Does it work? Doesn't it work? You're going to have to delve into your Python. Okay. This You have to delve into your Python because your Python is not finished. There are, there are some interesting things that your Python is not going to do. For example, um, we might then say, okay, now that we've applied a tier, we want to use that tier to make another decision, to change the floor finish. That needs to run on top of the information generated by the CSS. So I'm just saying, like, this is not easy. Um, Andrew, yep. Is, is our scripting locked? Pardon? Is our scripting locked by locked? Locked. Locked. Oh no, that's 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 just a cox thing that I've done. So it's logging out and you're giving it cox. No, no. Um, I have I have a script. Just so you know, it's just so you aware. That that's purely because I've written a code and it's in my template. Um, is this this is this is something for me that I use for me at work. Um, so do not log, this script logs data about this Grasshopper script and Rhino file, do not delete this. So that's just hiding this code. Um, this code, all, all it does is it finds the Rhino file that you're working on, if there is one, and it refines the Grasshopper file and it updates when uh, that file has been accessed and it writes it to this little log file in the same place as the grasshopper file and the rhino file, 
the reason and what it does is it just logs you know, like if i actually open that it logs the version the author the revision the description the path of the grasshopper file uh, and it also logs the path of the rhino file so there's that see there's setup.3dm bowl 3dm etc etc the reason it does that is because we have a lot of rhino files and a lot of grasshopper files being run on projects and sometimes when we come back to a project you know a year later maybe it got put on hold everyone's forgotten which grasshopper script gets run with which rhino file because they they're not the same thing right they're not in built into rhino and so this just helps us go find okay who opened what script with which rhino file so we know what they're connected to. I thought it was going to like show cross everything again. No, yeah. I don't need that. I don't want to see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So it's not it's not even making an internet connection. It's actually doing it on your computer. You you is there that log file on your? Yeah. Uh, Are you using Rhino Seven? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, you need to so um, unblock it. Go to properties and oh, right. it. Yeah, tree sloth does work. But he has like a long version. I like tree. Tree sloth is great. Yeah, it's needed to make things better. So, guys, do you wanna do you wanna discuss this more, or are you are you okay to move forward? Yeah, do you wanna just play around with it? Yeah, okay. I don't think I can progress, but. Okay, what do you mean? Why can't you progress? Oh, I, think it's just like, I, I need to like get this like yeah, okay. my head. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm yep, no, it's fine. Yeah. So, look, do you want, do you just want to call it a day and you can do this at home? Or, you know, give you, have a sleep and do it tomorrow? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, like, so much information that it's, it's difficult to. I know. I look. I understand. I just hit you with a Christina level class, right? Yeah. Um, and it's also because like a year ago was the last time that you did Python, right? Yes. But is this giving you? It's bringing Python back into your brain, right? I understand the like the concept. But yeah. It's, it's the CSS and J JSON stuff that's like I haven't really got much of it, and like the formatting is just yeah. a bit confusing. Hmm? Yeah, that one, and then right-click Yep. Uh, and like, what's better than what you have? What do you mean it doesn't work? Oh, you can't. I want to know, like, I want to know why it doesn't work. Why is it? Uh, it's fine. I'll work out what I'm going to just read read it. Out, you go to the website and just get a new link, get a new, get a new, um, I forget your email. Oh, did you see my new email address? Okay. Huh? 90 days, you get 90 days to buy your email. I had that on my resume. Email 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 okay. Come here, if, if, if it's us in it, uh, use this website. I, I used to do it, but I think now yeah, that it was right, it's fine. I used to do this, right? But like, yeah, when I, when I, yeah, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're getting, getting out. Uh, so, so just go open the generator and then click the activate the email and then use that email and then wait for it to give you a code. What does she put the word? Exactly. Question everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll figure it out. I'll figure it out for you. I'll somehow do it for you. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, hit me, hit me up on Slack. Like, I'm not doing it. You can't work it out. Okay. There's gonna be some. Russell, And I will process this video tonight. Thank you. Okay. Well, this will help us. Ah, well. uh, thank you. I think that the first. Uh, See you guys. See you, Sean. Wait, do you need to take out the theater? Yeah, I don't. I'm scared to touch it.